Hi, I'm David Alexander Bullock, and you're watching Talk with Taj. Welcome to another special edition of TWT TV. I have a very special guest with me in the building today, David Alexander Bullock. How you doing? I'm doing great, Taj. Good to be here. Uh, man, thank you for coming on our show, man. Hey, no problem, man. Uh, when we, uh, when I knew I was interviewing you, I said, you know what? This guy has a his resume is uh, all, it's, it's amazing. Wow, man! I, I appreciate had, that. <laughs> I had appreciate to go in there. After the reading up, I had to go in there do my do my you know my history and I had mm -hmm. to go do uh, my research. So, um, for those who are unfamiliar with David Alexander Bullock, kind of give him a little bit of the background. So, look, my name is David Alexander Bullock. I was born in Boston, grew up in Detroit. You may have seen me on The Preachers of Detroit, which is a reality TV show on Oxygen. I was also on Preachers of Atlanta. Um, done some MSNBC, CNN, and um, commentating, Huffington Post blogger. I'm a pastor as well, Greater St. Matthew Baptist Church in Highland Park, Bethany Baptist Church in Detroit. Recently just uh, ran a, a failed bid for city council at large in the city of Detroit, but it was a great experience. Yeah. And um, so I'm very, very active uh, in politics and social issues, and I'm the national spokesperson for the Change Agent Consortium. <laughs> Yeah. Is there anything else? Well, you know, I, I, I do sing and play and uh, do poetry, that kind of thing. You know. How do you fit all this into your day? What's your daily routine like? Well, you know, it's 16-hour uh, it's days. It's 14-hour uh, days. It's uh, no sleep till Brooklyn, Beastie Boys, you know. Um, but when you're doing what you love and you love what you do and you do it well and you're on a mission, you're driven, you know, you just sleep when you can and, and, and you just do the work. But So, you know, I really don't even think about how much I'm doing or, or what I'm doing. I, it's just got to well, do this, got to do this, got to do this. So with 16-hour days, um, I, what is your uh, – because I know a lot of lot of people who are in entertainment, okay, um, or politicians, activists, and they move around a lot. Right. So it's kind of hard. To, what, what do you do for the diet and that workout to keep – because a lot of – even entertainers, they have health issues mm -hmm. because they're moving around so much. So right. how do you keep that diet – and that fitness, when do you fit all that in into your business? Yeah, schedule? well, I'm, I'm working on that. I mean, you got to have a discipline, but I'll be, I'll be honest with you. You can do a lot in 30 minutes without any weights. I mean, so, you know, 200 push-ups every day, oh. 100 sit-ups or ab exercises. Great. You do 50-50-50-50 uh, <laughs> on right. the push-ups, you know. And, uh, man, that's like 15 minutes. So in 15 minutes, I do that in the morning. I'm good. If, if I'm at a hotel or at a, somewhere where I can run, I'll run. If you, you know, you can't run, swim, that kind of thing. As far as eating well, you know, you just it's really don't eat badly, right? So, right. you know, no bread, no rice, limited sugar, drink water, mm. and, you know, take your vitamins, yeah. you know, and, uh, <laughs> hey, and, 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 and you know, the good Lord do the rest. Yeah. But, but, you know, you definitely have, definitely, have, def, definitely have to watch what you eat and try to get rest when you can. Now, what I do, I do listen to my body, though. So right. when, when I'm going really hard and I need to, take 24 hours or 48 hours and just shut it down, I will. Okay. Right? So, you know, because um, if you overheat or bust a gasket, you know, then you're sick. Yeah. And so definitely you have to listen to your body. With the experience on uh, being on the preachers of uh, Detroit yeah. and Atlanta, correct? Yeah, right. Okay. Um, I know that was a different experience, you know, being a pastor and then all the, you know, um, the things that people, how they look at, how they view pastors who are on TV. Right. And, how, so tell me a little bit about that experience and what did you what you gained from all that? Well, it would, let me say it was a great experience. And shout out to Holly Carter. Shout out to uh, Lemuel Plumber, the folks at Oxygen, Releve Entertainment, um, the L Plumber Group. And he's doing, you know, media moguls and Stoop Dog stuff. I mean, so Lemmy's doing well. Holly's doing well. That's Releve Entertainment. Shout out to them for pushing the vision, for leaving L.A., for coming to Detroit. I think that was a bold step. It was a big step. People didn't, didn't know if it was going to work. Turned out that it did work. And then Detroit was different from L.A. Yeah. L.A. was a little lighter, softer, faster, flashier. Detroit was a little grimier, gutter, slower, you know, uh, but more significant socially. And, and somehow the producers created space for folks like me to be able to platform not only preaching but activism, you know, uh, street ministry as well as sanctuary ministry. And so it was a great opportunity. But I will say this, a lot of haters, man. I mean, um, but most of that hate comes from pastors, right? So it's like, you so know. It wasn't coming from the actual viewers of the show. People who don't go to church love me, right? <laughs> oh, wow. Pe people who are kind of on the fence, right? People who are activists but may not have found space in churches. 
and then don't get me wrong, I, we do get support from the church community. Mm -hmm. But most of the people who have a problem with me are like senior pastors, senior, senior pastors. I feel like guys. you shouldn't have been on the show. Shouldn't have been on the show. You know, you're making the church look bad. You're exposing us. You shouldn't have talked to the bishops that way. You shouldn't have asked those questions. Or you're just grandstanding, trying to make a name for yourself. I mean, all of the typical can I say BS on talk yes. talk with Taj? Yes, you yes. know all of this typical <laughs> BS, the malarkey, the shill bit. You know that people throw your way. Um, you know, so I'm a PK. I grew up in the church. My okay. father was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. My mother was a PK. Her father was a pastor. Ooh. So I understand how church can be, and um, but it still was shocking. Not this wasn't coming from church people. This was coming from pastors and church leaders. So that, you know that was a little rough to deal with at times. So if you if you could take anything away from the experience, what would it be? Well, positively, I would say there's, there's nothing like having a platform. And a lot of times pastors are limited, limited mm -hmm. by a reverend, right, limited Correct. by the title, mm -hmm. and then limited by the platform. Because if it's not a service or a Sunday, if it's not a funeral, then, like, you know, people don't really look for pastors, right? right? But the reality TV show platform, you know, I'm a pastor, but I'm, a, but I'm legitimately an entertainer. I was on an entertainment platform. Right, which opens it up. I can host stuff, you know. I can MC stuff, you know. I can show up to events, you know, as David Alexander Bullock from the Preacher series, Correct. right, and still had influence, you know. Um, definitely went from Michigan to the nation, Michigan to the world. I mean, we have people in South Africa that contact me on Facebook or via email all the time. You know, no matter where I go across the United States of America, people recognize me. But what's cool about me mm -hmm. is it's not like, hey, I recognize you. It's like, oh, you're a Bullock, right? You know, and we, I'm doing some of the same stuff in my town that, that I saw you doing in Detroit. Sure. Let's link up. So, you know, right now we're in the process of trying to just link up with like-minded people who are fighting some of those same issues in their community. I mean, so positively, that's great. Negatively, uh, I would say there are no negatives. It, it, was, it was amazing. I mean, <laughs> I wasn't looking for one. I was just saying, yeah, you know, you, know, yeah. you know, haterism yeah. and all that. You're going to get hated on no matter what you do, so you might as well get hated on doing what you do. Okay. Now, I know you have this nickname, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The General. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they was calling me the General <laughs> this morning. I, yeah, I was on a panel discussion with, uh, at, uh, let me shout out, uh, Pastor Liggins, Mount Olive uh, Missionary Baptist Church. He was like, we're going to hear from the General. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. So real quick, let me, let me take a step back. Yeah. Would you do reality TV again or that was, you're done with well, reality TV? No, actually, I would do it again. Um, I actually have a radio show on 9, 10 a.m., Monday through Friday, based out of Detroit, but it covers most of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a we got a concept we're working on okay. where people get to see me, right, in, doing the radio format. So it's like pastor, activist, and then like Everybody. radio personality. <laughs> and you know, because there's drama in the station and drama with the producers, and you know, yeah. drama, you know, fighting the issue or like you know, because I go hard on the radio. Like okay. people saw preachers of Detroit, mm -hmm. I'm like that on the radio. So then oh, yeah. the callers call in, or you're talking about somebody, and you see them at a restaurant later on that day. And they like, oh, I heard your show today. And I was like, yeah, you are punk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so we got a concept for following Bullock as a radio personality. Okay. And, and uh, that's something I'm getting ready to shop. And, uh, you know, stay tuned. You got Look. this nickname. I want to know, and the people want to know, how did you earn this name? Where did it come from, the general? Well, you know what I'm saying? We are soldiers in the Army of the Lord, yes, sir. right? And so if we are soldiers and we are in the Army, the Army has a hierarchy. Right, yeah. people talk about the de the demonic being organized, mm -hmm. right? Well, I believe that the, the divine is organized too, and so if there are foot soldiers, there are generals, yes, right? And so I earned that because I came up the hard way, right? right? But I also command an army because you can't do the work that I do by yourself, right? So you know, it's it's like a term of endearment. People say it to me affectionately. Some people get mad, you know. Oh, here come the general. It's crazy because like, hey, oh, here come the general. And I'm like, but. You still call me the general, like you know. <laughs> you know. I, I, yeah, I still get that respect. Right, right, but definitely got the respect, man. I mean, because people, I've been doing this work, man. I'm 39 years old. I started preaching when I was 12. I've been oh. pastoring for 12 years. Started pastoring when I was 25. You know, I, I went to uh, Morehouse when I was 16 and a half. Graduated from high school when I was 16. You oh, know, wait, stop right there. Yeah, I did read that, but I know you graduated. You graduated from. High school when I was 16. 16. Yeah, went to Morehouse, graduated from Morehouse so when I was 19. had enough credits or you tested out? Well, I took all the credits. When I okay. got to high school, I was 13, 12. Right. I was 12 when I got to high school, 13. Right. Yeah, okay. right. And so then I graduated, I was 16. All right. 
you know, and uh, went to Morehouse, 19, I got my, my master's, uh, 2003, I was 21, 22, start, taught college for like 12 years before I was even got into pastoring, you know, but as far as the activism work and reaching out, but, you know, I've been doing that for years, mentoring, feeding, clothing, public policy work, worked with the NAACP, worked with uh, Rainbow Push, Reverend Jesse Jackson's organization, you know, started the Change Agent Consortium. I mean, so this is work that I've been doing for a while. So a lot of people kind of, they see the TV show, mm -hmm. I look young, and they're like, oh, this guy's just a, a new face. I mean, it might be new to you, right, you know, but we've been doing this for like, you know, 25 years, you know. And so, you know, the general, I mean, you know, you earn your stripes, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. What is, um, what's the biggest issue, in your opinion, uh, facing the black uh, the black church oh man now that's the whole show i mean <laughs> the biggest issue facing the black church um i think the black church really has just lost its identity you know when dr king was around the black church was pulled into the civil rights movement the black church came kicking and screaming dr king left the national baptist convention started the progressive national baptist convention started the selc but the time was right in the country and then you saw the black church being pulled into it when those four girls got b blown up in 16th Street Baptist Church, right? You know, um, when Rosa Parks went to jail. I mean, these are church folks. So the church got pulled into the movement. You know, but after 68, 69, you know, Dr. King's gone, the black church really doesn't have an identity. You know, and you still have ministers who are activists, but you don't have the church as a whole behind one agenda. And I think that's a big challenge because now everybody's kind of all in their own corner, you know. And then a part of that is a lot of pastors are going now for the money and not the members, right, going for the prosperity and not the preaching. Yeah. So, you know. I know a lot of people who um, will not attend a church, yeah. have an issue trying to locate the right church or just won't deal with it at all because of that very fact so what do we need to do what does the black church need to do to show people that we are about saving souls it's not about money this is about saving souls but understand that church does have bills you know yeah definitely lights, definitely definitely, lights, definitely, so, definitely, um, definitely so what are, what are the steps the black church needs to do and no matter what city and state they're in to get people to understand you know what this is we're, we, we mean what we say well, I think it's time for a new generation to rise up and stand up. I think you have to, it starts with the ministers. And so we need a new group of ministers that put Christ over currency, right? Um, you know, Christ Message. over collections, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that kind of thing. But then you also have to have a new kind of member, right? Because what people don't understand is that pastors will never go much farther than their members will allow them to, yeah. right? You know, so you have a lot of pastors that are slaves to their membership. Because they can't be radical because their membership will release them. I may not be able to uh, put this up. Yeah, you know, you <laughs> might not, you know, because if you preach the wrong message, they give you a parachute. You know what I'm saying? Um, so you have to, we, we, need new, we need a new ministerial core. We need new members, and, and we need a church that just does the work. Don't worry about what people are saying. Do the work, and then let the work speak for itself. Um, let's move. We're going to go to the... Uh to election. Yeah, man. Okay. Trump America. So, yeah. <laughs> so we knew we know we, we now have a new elect president, uh, yeah. Donald Trump. Um what's your thoughts on the election and his presidency, his upcoming presidency? Well, I mean, my thoughts are like most people. I mean, shocked, you know, uh awed. Uh it is it's amazing, you know, that this could happen in the United States of America. You know, it's positive and negative. I mean, it's positive because it maybe it's a wake up call to white liberals. Who thought racism was dead, right? And to middle middle class and upper middle class blacks, who thought that somehow we were living in a post racial America. Remember when President Barack Obama got elected? Everybody told us we were living in a post racial America. They wanted to dismantle the NAACP, right? They wanted colorblind curriculum, no need for HBCU, right? Yeah. And so now maybe all of those folks can see the error of their ways. Maybe we lost eight years, but now we can continue to build. We can get back to the agenda. But I think on the other side, it's like. How does a guy win an election on a message like that? I mean, just really interesting to me. And how do people vote for somebody to be president, you know, not only with racist rhetoric, but sexist rhetoric, you know, F you. And I mean, just things that President Barack Obama couldn't say and good white presidents of the past wouldn't say. Right. So if if celebrity is enough to swing you into the White House, then what does that mean for the future of our country? Do you believe that if um, he was going up against a male 
Democrat, he would have lost the election? I don't know, because I think Donald Trump surged. First of all, remember, he beat out a strong Republican field. I mean, Jeb Bush should have got the nomination, maybe. Right? Mark Rubio, right? Ted Cruz. I mean, he, he didn't beat people who weren't career politicians. So the assumption is if the Democrat was a career politician and a man, right, he would have been competition for Trump. But the Republican men weren't competition for Trump. Trump surged. I mean, he tapped into a um, an anger, a frustration, not just at a black president, but at a Democratic Party that had run the, the office of White House in the country for eight years and kind of delivered but didn't, right? You know, you got pre-existing conditions covered. You got Osama bin Laden dead, but people don't have jobs, right? And so he tapped into that. Make America great again. Now, to white people, that means go back to when everybody was in their place. But, you know, some black people heard that and said, well, maybe that means manufacturing jobs coming back. I mean, you what know. What does it mean for you? Make America great again. Yeah, when he said that, what did it mean? Oh, uh, man, that's a Southern Dixie crat, uh, racist, conservative, Republican rhetoric. Um for white supremacy i mean that's what it is you know but the thing about codes and symbols is that they, they can mean anything to anybody and he was savvy and sophisticated with that remember donald trump is a master communicator he is not a preacher though he's not president barack obama but he was on reality tv and had a top show for many years he's a master communicator and if you watch him his antics uh, his ability to change the conversation his ability to get you to be distracted Right. So you say so before, you know, you maybe we would have asked critical questions about his candidacy, but he was so good at distracting us. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And 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 then when he spoke, he, he said very simple things in soundbite form. So Hillary was doing high politics, high intellectualism. My plan for the world is and he was saying jobs for everybody. I mean, and so. <laughs> right. I see right? And so he tapped into <laughs> where America is. And he won. And not only did he win, but the Republicans won everything. So this yeah. isn't just Trump. This is Congress. This is the Supreme so, Court. So now, okay, you're saying Trump won knowing how to manipulate the mind right. and manipulate media. Clinton kept it classy, held her, kept her composure, and composer. was boring. So where do you think she went wrong? She Is that boring. the same thing that killed her? She was boring. Okay. You can, I mean, President Barack Obama's classy and entertaining. Michelle Obama has composure, but you want to see her, yeah. you want to hear her, right? And when she's talking, she's talking good, right? I mean, Hillary was boring. She, uh, she didn't have any excitement. She seemed to have low energy. You know, they they caught her fainting. I mean, her speeches, her speech patterns, her voice, the tone of her voice. I mean, she just didn't tap into uh, an energy that was there. And I'm not saying that's the only reason why she lost. But definitely Donald Trump, you know, uh, he animated people, you know, and she didn't. What advice would you give the black community to get through these next four years? Man, that's a powerful question. I mean, what do we do now? Like Dr. Right. King wrote it, where do we go from here, chaos or community, Malcolm X, Ballad of the Bullet? You know, do we have a violent revolution and overthrow? Do we do the Black Panther Party thing and get guns and self-defense, Black Panther Party for self-defense, shotguns and berets? Hell no, right? I mean, this is what we do. we got to get smart. And we got to play the game of politics the way it was meant to be played in the United States of America. We've got to organize our own money. We've got to support our own candidates. We've got to support both parties. And we've got to develop an agenda for us. We've got to get involved in international trade. Donald Trump borrows money from China. Why don't you? America borrows money from China. Why don't okay. you? So let me ask, let me ask you this. Um, you have a, a, uh, we have low-income yeah. families all over America. Right. Okay. Um, not a lot of jobs. Right. Okay. So what what is their next step? Because it's different. It's different next steps for where you're at in life right now. Okay. Um, so what do they do? Come January. Well, their immediate next step is to watch the news and make sure the Republicans don't dismantle federal aid that comes to them. So if they're getting EBT, WIC, SSI, right, whatever they're getting, right, you know, that's on the chopping block. So they, so they need to wake up, get engaged. I don't care if they high, drunk, tired, lazy, uh, or illiterate. They need to make sure that the, whatever they get now, they protect, and they need to protect it at all costs. And I, and I, so that's one. We need to protect what we have. But beyond that, I think we need to get innovative, right? You know, uh, whether you're low income, no income, or middle income, get involved in a party, 
I say get involved in both parties. You know, that's what rich folks do. They support both parties. Don't just vote on election day. Become a precinct delegate, right? Go to go to the district convention. You know, get involved so that you can have some leverage uh, when the gubernatorial race comes around or when the midterm elect. We need to be gearing up for the midterms, sure. right? Because yeah. because they can get the they keep the presidency for four, right? But they can lose House and Senate in two, right? So we need to be gearing up for that. Uh, but beyond that, I think there's some things we can do financially, right? So, so how many black businesses have EBT machines, right? I mean, how come the folks who sell us chicken and ribs in our communities don't eat it? How come the people that sell us chicken and ribs don't don't look like us? Mm-hmm. And they have EBT machines, right? There's so much money coming to coming to the hood through the EBT machine. Black businesses need to get those machines. Okay, but well, let me ask you. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Is that also hurting us? Because now we, we do have a lot of people who are getting the EBT service. Right. You know, right. Um, you got some people who are doing it. They've been doing it for generations. Right. Okay. You got some people who actually can't help it. They have to be, you know, they can't actually go get a job. They might be physically disabled, mental have a mental disease or a mental illness or something. So everybody, everybody's not capable to go get that good job. Right. But for those who can, is it the same thing that's helping us? Is it the same thing as hurting? First of all, if the federal government has an agency called the USDA, and they have money to make sure nobody in America is hungry, use the money, eat, and eat well. The bottom line is this. To eat well, it costs money, right? So, so I don't think it's hurting us. I just think that there are dollars coming to our community, and we're not capturing those dollars. Somebody else is. So, for instance, you know, in Michigan, we got Captain Jay's Fish and Chicken. I heard they were in Indiana, too. Right and um, <laughs> Captain Jay's fish Captain and Jay's fish and chicken. I, I gotta look yeah, into yeah, that. They might be in Fort Wayne or somewhere, yeah. you know. But the bottom line is, they are a chicken joint that actually is categorized as a grocery store. So they put an EBT machine in the chicken joint, right? And they are capturing millions of dollars a month by way of people using the federal government money to for for food stamps, right? To promote a business model. So I'm just saying, as black folks. If somebody saw that business model and saw our community as the fuel for that model, I mean, why don't we create that own model and capture those dollars ourselves? That's all I'm saying. I mean, think about taxes, for instance. You know, we got a lot of uh, babies born out of wedlock. Mm-hmm. But if the baby mama claims the, the kids on the taxes, if assuming she's doing taxes, then the baby daddy can't. Right? He can't get no tax deduction for the diapers he bought. So I'm saying we need a tax code. For baby mamas and baby daddies. I'm just saying, yeah. right? Because now the brother <laughs> might be more involved and he can claim what he spent on his taxes. And if he get a refund, that's more money, right, for the baby and for him. Because the whole concept of traditional marriage is not really biblical at all, right? It's more so economic. That when you have a husband and a wife and two incomes, the credit is better, the house is bought, and there's more stability for the children. When you got baby mamas... It dilutes your money. When you got baby daddies, you're not getting no money. So if we have a tax code for low-income baby mamas and baby daddies, they can claim these. Both parents can claim the kids whether they're married or not, right? Then maybe both parents get a refund. I say let's do a tax deduction for families who have uh, able-bodied men and women who can work behind bars. You You should get a tax deduction for that, right? You know, the federal government should give you a tax break. If you got folks behind bars, you put money on their books, but you can't claim it on your taxes. Wow. Right? You traveling to go see them, but I mean, you're not claiming it on your taxes. Uh, this probably goes along with uh, the last question, but there's been talks about a black agenda. What do you see that looking like? Well, number one, I see a black agenda, first of all, including uh, money, right? Money for black businesses, financing for black businesses. Um, let's incubate black banks. Or maybe not black banks, but community development financial institutions, which are unregulated entities that can accept money much like banks can. See, the whole whole reason for having a bank is not to have a savings account or a checking account. You want a bank because banks leverage money 10 to 1, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you got uh, a small amount of money, but you got a bank, small amount of money becomes a bigger pot. I think also we need African Americans to develop food co-ops. We need to get into urban gardening, urban farming. Um, you know, so economic co-ops, food co-ops. We need an agenda that organizes us beyond protests, right? I'm tired of hashtags and T-shirts, right? We got to start writing checks, you know what I mean? Uh, Buying land. African Americans need to develop trade missions to Africa and China and India. We need to take back the hair care industry, 
right? Yeah, we need to take yes, take yes. back the nail tech industry. Yes. Right? We need to take back the industries that we use and that were ours. That's a real black agenda. And then once we get the finance and the money right, and get a spiritual center, right? Then we can then we can do the politics right because a lot of times the politics fails, the movement fails because fails because we can't pay for it. Mm. So we got to get our money right. As a pastor and politician, how do you feel about politicians um, pandering the church? black church for votes oh man you know as long as there's a black church there'll be a pandering politician you know but that's not the best of us that's the worst of us we're much better than that henry mcneil turner was the ame preacher he's a politician um congressman adam clayton powell mm -hmm. was a preacher he's a politician reverend nat turner was a reverend he's a protester revolutionary reverend uh reverend dr martin Luther king never ran for elected office but he was involved in social issues reverend jesse jackson reverend al sharpton right and so the best of us uh, is a church that sees God as the God of the oppressed, James Cone, Jesus and the Disinherited, Howard Thurman, uh, a church that says if you really want to see who Jesus is, find the weak, find the lost, the least, the left out, and you'll find Jesus there. And when you find him there, what is he saying? I have been anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Right? So a Jesus that talks economics, a Jesus that saw a woman caught in adultery because she was trying to eat, and he told her accusers leave her alone and told her, don't send no more, which means he must have gave us some money too. And so we've got to move from individual salvation and pie in the sky to group salvation and getting it before I die. How important is voting and uh, what's the best way for our vote to benefit our community? Voting is very important. Um, we fought for the right to vote because we needed it, but it's not a silver bullet. And so we have to vote. But beyond voting, we have to be organized. We have to have a position, a platform. Uh, and we and, and when we vote, we have to be conscious voters, right? It's, it doesn't really make sense just to vote for who has the most commercials or vote for somebody because somebody else told you to, right? But we have to vote like we go to the movies. You have to vote like we listen to hip-hop. You have to vote like we pick gym shoes. You have to vote like we pick our cars. You know, you pick the car that works for you. You pick the gym shoes uh, that are not just hot, uh, but the ones that are the right ones at the time. You pick the music that you like. You investigate, you know, is it Rihanna, is it Beyonce, right? You know, I mean, so is it Jay-Z, is it Talib Kweli? I mean, so you pick the music that you like. Yeah, he's right? rapping over here yeah, low-key, you know, you right? know, he's, <laughs> he's a few yeah, bars. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> I got bars, I got four <laughs> bars. Right? So, you know, we have to be conscious voters is what okay. I'm saying, yeah. Um, looking at cities like Detroit and uh, other other urban communities, how do we re how do we rebuild our education system and economy by depending less on our government? Well, I think we should depend on our government, actually. I think we should depend on our government because we pay taxes, and America was founded on one key point, no taxation without representation, mm -hmm. right? And um, so since we're being taxed, we should be represented. And so we pay for public school. Public school isn't free, right? right? We pay for roads and sidewalks and police officers. It's not free, right? We pay, we pay for TSA. We pay for CIA. We pay for FBI, right? So we pay for public schools. And so let's depend on our government. Let's make our government do what it's supposed to do. Schools like Michigan State University, land-grant institutions that were paid for by the government to educate its citizens. You can't have a democracy with ignorant people, right? So you have to raise the consciousness of the people so they can be citizens. So we demand that from our government. An, idi an idiotic people threatens domestic security. And so really education is a domestic security issue. The smarter the people, the stronger the nation. Mm -hmm. Our government should do that. But I think beyond that, we should go past what we get in schools, uh, and we should be educating in the homes and in the churches. And I think uh, also we should have a, a conversation about uh, the... President Obama is leaving office. Do you feel he's done enough to advance black America? Yeah, it's a tricky question. I think uh, the obvious answer is he hasn't done enough. Uh, but what do we ask him to do? And so, True. you know, it's easy to blame the president for not meeting our needs or fulfilling our agenda. But I don't, I don't think we ever really gave the president an agenda. I mean, he did help HBCUs, uh, you know, in many ways. The health care reform, the pre-existing condition stuff is going to help us as well. Uh, he was a great symbol of African-American intellectual integrity, of African-American political savvy. I mean, he's a smooth brother. He knows how to talk, you know, he knows what to say, says it well. His family, no scandals, you know. The daughters went off the rails a little bit at the end, the oldest one. But, I mean, for the most part, I mean, he was a class act. Now, um, 
what we have to understand though is that the the president is not a pastor the president is not a political activist the president really might not may, the president the president may not also be a public policy wizard and so ultimately once he was elected we should have demanded that he accomplish 10 things right you know god told moses go to pharaoh he gave him something to say let him go he didn't just stand in front of pharaoh and say god sent me here right he gave him something to say let him go right god told moses lead the children of israel he gave him 10 points don't do this do this don't do this we elected the president we went to the ball had a party came home and didn't tell him what to do whose fault is that uh, we protest, organize, and mobilize, but how do we gain political power and get our voices heard? Well, I think we need to develop our own PACs, statewide PACs, local PACs, national PAC. Uh, we need to fund ourselves. We need to pool our money. We need to begin to understand that protest without a policy demand is just a march. You know, Dr. Mm -hmm. King walked in the street, but they were, they were marching in the street for legislation to be passed, a hashtag on a T-shirt, fist in the air. Black Lives Matter with no demand. It's just a march, right? It's just, it's a parade from nowhere to nowhere, not asking for anything, right? Nowhere to nowhere, nothing. What's that? That's not social change. That's just venting, right? And so we have kind of this political masturbation that we like to do, rub up against each other in the street, right? And then experience euphoria, go back home, but we haven't done anything. We just feel better. It's kind of like a monster ball approach to politics. Holly Berry told Billy Bob Thornton, I don't care what happens in my life, just make me feel good. He banged away. And then when they were tired, they laid on the floor and felt better. That's black folks. You know, we're just banging away at it in front of some building on Facebook Live. But we don't. Oh, my God. And it's, uh, it's, it, you uh. laugh it because we, people think, they, oh, it was great, right? Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. we changed the world. You changed the world? Do we have a czar over law enforcement? Do we have a federal law enforcement czar? Imagine this. When they impeached Bill Clinton, they, they appointed a special prosecutor to investigate him. Okay? You trying to tell me they can't appoint a special prosecutor to investigate every case of police brutality? Right? So you march in the street with the hashtag, right? LeBron wears the t-shirt to the game, but we don't have a czar investigating law enforcement de uh, departments. Right? So when another black kid gets killed, you won't get a criminal conviction. Because the threshold is too high. The police officer says, I, I felt threatened. And so all the family can get is money, right? But a bag of money is a poor substitute for justice. And so mommy and daddy are drunk and paid, but the blood's still crying out. So all I'm saying is, is that we've got to move from protest to a politics that uses protesting as a tool to get stuff done. But first of all, we got to know what we're asking for, right? Power can see nothing without a demand. Frederick Douglass knew that. We're so far from him. And so we, we are a generation that watched eyes on the prize but never did the research. So we saw people marching in the street and thought they changed the world. We saw Selma, but we never knew in the movie what Dr. King was asking for. And so we're imitating the movie, but we're not getting nothing because we don't have the whole formula. So we got to put it back together. Covered a lot of material. Yeah. And uh, I got to have you back. Hey, I'm coming back. Let me know. I'd like back. to come back this year. Um, but I want you to tell the viewers, um, uh, black America, uh, angry Americans that Trump is president, all, everybody, um, you got any final thoughts, any message you want to give out to the people? Look, we've been here before. We've been through worse. We've been through slavery. We've been through the Middle Passage. We've been through segregation. Right? We've been through uh, degradation. We've been through Jim Crowism. We're in the prison industrial complex now. If there's anything we know, we know that we can stay alive maybe even thrive in the belly of the beast. I'm not worried about Trump or Pence, right? I'm not worried about America over the next four years because as long as we are together and have faith and fight, we win. I hate to say it, I say it all the time, I say it again, we never lost the battle that we fought, but we never won a battle until we fought. It's time for us to fight.